Well, a few years ago, Lauren and I were living in Dallas, Texas, as most of you know. But when we were living there, we would occasionally visit evening worship services at different churches across the city. We were part of one church in particular close to our home, but, but throughout the week, because we weren't around our family and we didn't have that many friends, frankly, we went to church a lot. We would just go to different churches that we could get, it, could get to. Um, and we, we went to a lot of different kinds of churches because we were far from our, our home, we were far from our family, um, and we were part of a church that was slightly outside of our comfort zone. So we ended up going to different churches beyond Sunday morning just to experience more of what God was doing in the city of Dallas. We knew we weren't going to live there forever, so we wanted to see as much of what God was doing as we could. And there was one night that we attended a worship service at a church that was much more charismatic than either of us were used to. And yet we were drawn in for the powerful worship music, and we'd heard really good things about the people. So we, the, 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 the witness of the church was out there in the community. We heard about it, and we went. We showed up. And I can remember the sense of excitement that there was in the air as we stood up for worship. I mean, there was no parking anywhere. It took us forever even to get into the church. There was just people all over the place. So I knew something was interesting that was about this church. And the musicians are tuning up, and you can kind of hear the end of what was probably a sound check happening. But before the musicians launched into their first song of worship, there was a pastor who got up, and he gave a sort of introduction to the evening. And I will never forget what he said to all of us. There's people packed everywhere. He said, we do not know what is about to happen. And then he stood there. And I was kind of like, what? <laughs> How do you start with that? How do you stand up and just say, we do not know what is about to happen? Because I've been raised in churches all of my life, and I've been in many kinds of Christian fellowships for worship, and I was pretty sure that I knew what was about to happen. But then he pressed the point. He said, we do not know what is about to happen because we serve a surprising God. We serve a God who we do not fully understand. We serve a God who we cannot always see coming. It blew my mind. I knew that truth, but I'd never been invited to ponder it at this exact moment when I felt most certain about God. Then he gave examples from the New Testament of people raised from the dead, of others who were struck dead for lying to the Holy Spirit, and of others still who saw miracles and signs and wondrous works in their everyday lives when God chose to make himself known. And as we began to worship, it hit me. We were worshiping the same God who sent a whale to swallow Jonah. Same God. We were worshiping the same God who yelled the gospel into a dark place for Lazarus to come out, and then he did. We were worshiping the same God who fed 5,000 people with nothing more than about a Subway sandwich worth of bread and fish. Right? You ever held a Subway sandwich? Not a lot of food. Our God is outlandish. Our God is surprising. And he's always on the move in ways that I could not have predicted, even though I sense that I should be able to predict it. And as I worshiped God that evening, a realization came to my mind and heart, and it's this, and maybe, maybe for you too. I need God to be this way because so many circumstances in our world just seem to be impossible to see my way through, even though I like the idea of, of a predictable world. It's not actually that helpful if it actually is going to be what I predict because I don't have the resources to get through the world as I predict it will be. So I need a God who's surprisingly involved, and that is who he is. I need a God for whom nothing is impossible. Yeah. Well, if you look at your heart, I would wager that you find that same need if you do the reflective work. We all need a God 
who reserves the right to surprise us with his power and with his purpose. This morning, I would like us to move forward in our Advent series by way of the work that we've been doing in our Advent theme. Each week, we've talked about one aspect of the process of prayer, of getting ready to encounter God. We started by acknowledging that prayer is birthed into desperation, right, in that first week, that voice of Isaiah, and yet it is formalized in this moment of petition. It is a movement from desperation to petition. And then we pushed further into the process of prayer by dealing with what it would mean to cross the Rubicon of repentance, move from a place of desperation into a moment of petition. You begin to ask God, you are, we are, and then you prepare and you sense that there is a call to repentance. And we've heard from heralds before, the prophet Isaiah and John the Baptist this last week. Now, this third week of Advent, we're going to hear from the angel Gabriel, another herald, as he interacts with Mary and bringing her the most surprising news ever in the Annunciation scene of Luke 1, 26 to 38. I invite you to turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 1, 26 to 38. As we look at this Annunciation scene of the coming of our Lord, we'll first consider what this Annunciation means in a world full of human impossibilities, a world that is is predictably full of the kinds of things that people cannot overcome. And next, we'll examine the way this scene elucidates or makes clear the nature of divine promises and how they interact with a world full of human impossibilities. And finally, we'll consider together what it looks like in this third week of Advent to follow the model of Mary, to stay open to the Almighty. Let's read Luke 1, starting in verse 26. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying, and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How will this be, since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative, Elizabeth, in her old age, has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Wow. Such a wonderful bit of Scripture. And yet such a familiar bit of Scripture. I would imagine you knew every aspect of this before you read it. Or at least probably because you've heard it in church many times. Especially as Christmas approaches, we might expect to hear this passage. Maybe you've been waiting for this passage to come. And yet, we must not allow our familiarity with the scene to blind us to the very real treasures that it contains. We want to stop and look at each of them this morning. 
In the preceding weeks, we've been considering the way in which prayer moves us from desperation to petition to preparation, as I saw. And now, we're finally at this moment that we can only call encounter right? You've got all these voices. Someone's coming. Someone's coming. Someone's coming. We're reaching out. Lord, send someone. Lord, come. Lord, arrive. Please, we're begging you. And then into the world comes somebody from beyond the world. Into the world comes Gabriel to interact with Mary and to say, essentially, God's on the move. God has heard the cries of the world. This is a moment of encounter. And as we pray, This is the moment that we are hoping for existentially in our own lives. We are hoping to hear from God. And in this scene, the angel Gabriel has come bearing a message from God. It's an answer, really, to the desperate petition of all the world. This encounter that Mary is having with Gabriel, it's it's one that comes with a message, and that message is an announcement. It's the kind of message that it is. So it's an enunciation of the one who is coming, if you will. This enunciation is a surprising one for several different reasons, but the chief reason is because it comes into a world that's characterized by a distinct and enduring awareness of certain humanly impossible things, human impossibilities. This message from Gabriel, it comes to Mary and to all the world in such a way as to highlight the surprising power and the surprising wisdom of God. The way that God comes into the world to make Himself known and then to redeem the world is by way of two things that should be humanly impossible, or that at least seem humanly impossible. But more importantly, these two impossibilities are tied up with two fundamental sources of human longing, if you begin to think of what these two impossibilities represent. The first human impossibility through which God chooses to work has to do with the mystery of procreation and human life. Mary is a virgin and yet shall be with child. Elizabeth is a barren woman past her childbearing years and yet is pregnant. Humanly impossible situation. Since I've entered a life stage where children are being born and I'm around families with others who are having children, I know there are many complexities to navigating the process of procreation. I've seen firsthand the the great sense of natural longing that is bound up in the process of becoming pregnant, remaining pregnant, and then delivering a baby safely. It's intense business. It's a process that for all of our medical advances in the year 2021, it's a process that remains strangely out of our control in certain ways. And because it's so often out of our control, it remains a place of deep mystery and faith in God. It really does. In Mary's day, it would have been even more mysterious and all the more a place of dependence and longing for her. Mary is a virgin. Surely it is plainly impossible to be a pregnant virgin, right? There's no news here. This is still plainly impossible. And yet Gabriel is saying that she will not only become pregnant without sex, but she will bear one who will be called the Son of the Most High. That's his title. Virgins do not get pregnant, and barren women past childbearing years do not suddenly become pregnant. At least these are supposed to be the laws of the universe. This is what you would predict. And yet into this place of profound human longing, into this place of of seemingly human impossibility, God has begun to work. This is His way in. The second place of really deep longing in this text is also a place of seemingly human impossibility. This one's a little bit more subtle. I want you to see it. The angel Gabriel is telling Mary, and through Mary, all of Israel and all of the world, 
that the throne of David is going to be upheld. The throne of David is going to be upheld. Now, now why would we consider that an impossibility, right? You kind of understand the virgin with a baby thing. That still strikes us as obviously impossible and, and kind of amazing. But why this? Isn't this hypothetically possible at any time? Couldn't some man come along at any time and occupy this throne? Well, the Davidic covenant as initiated in 2 Samuel 7 and then further referenced in Psalm 89, right? They both say that this throne shall be occupied with a descendant of David forever. This is God's promise. And yet, ever since Nebuchadnezzar removed Zedekiah from the throne a long time ago, right, there has not been a descendant of David sitting on the throne. Big problem. Very big problem. What's going on? Somewhere around 500 years has passed at least, and it seemed more and more impossible that the throne of David was ever going to be upheld. Can you even imagine how long? Five, that's like longer than our whole country's been here. Like, would you still be thinking that that was going to happen? Right? I don't even think of things that are 500 years old on a daily basis. And yet that is what this angel shows up to say. This is going to be upheld. And this fact of its lack of a king on the throne, that would have been a source of grievous longing for God's people. They had a much longer memory than I do, right? They're thinking in much longer periods of time, the much deeper anxiety. And these are the questions they might have asked as a people. Will deliverance ever come? Will it ever come? Are we stuck like this under the boot of Rome, under the boot of whoever? Will we ever be ruled by God's man again? Will we, will we ever have justice and mercy and right rule in our own God-given land again? Right? These are the deep existential questions of Israel. These were the longings of a people who were losing hope. And yet Gabriel comes with an enunciation of just such an impossible solution. The man named Jesus, born of a virgin, the Son of the Most High, he will sit on this throne forever. And here's the point. If you take these two impossibilities, these two seemingly human, impossibly fulfilled longings, they're stoked together, the human heart has to ask this question, can all be finally made right? That's what these two things represent, the, the question of impossible procreation solution and impossible uh, theopolitical deliverance. They, just these two things that are way outside of your individual capacity to solve for. Nobody can solve them. And they would have together given you the impression that, that really maybe there's no hope that things will ever be made right. But Gabriel says in verse 37, for nothing will be impossible with God. As Christians, we are those who look at the existential questions and the longings of all humanity, the questions that are asked in the dead of night that feel impossible to answer, questions of our own guilt or of shame or of mercy, right? Questions of justice and hope and identity, questions of purpose, questions of what life means. And we are the people who can answer Yes, all is and will be made right in Jesus Christ. The things that seem to be impossible to achieve in this world, the great animating problems of human life and action, they find their blessed answer in a baby born to a young woman who has not ever had sex. So what is humanly impossible has actually occurred and the very nature of the world itself has changed because of an impossible birth. We've seen the way in which these longings, which really seem humanly impossible, even I would say they are at one level, these longings are a sight of God's saving activity. Now, we should see in the text the way in which God's saving activity 
flows out of divine promises, divine promises that come from who He is. I believe the text shows us at least three aspects of God's activity that demonstrate His promise as His source of blessing, that promise grounded in Himself. The first aspect of God's activity that you see in the text, it flows straight out of God's prerogative. It's God's prerogative. He has the right and privilege of bestowing favor on whoever He wills. It is up to Him. Isn't this what Gabriel says to Mary? Verse 28, and he came to her and said, greetings, O favored one. That's how he refers to her. O favored one, the Lord is with you. She was greatly troubled at the saying. She tries to discern what sort of greeting it is. I would probably ask the same question, what is happening, right? And the angel says to her again, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. So, he's now used this word two times. Clearly, it's important. Clearly, it's part of the message of what's happening in this text. God shows favor on whom He will. His favor, it can't be earned in any sense. He dispenses grace because it flows out of His own heart, because He has favor on who He will. Even though Mary is a wonderful and ideal person in many ways, and we'll look at that shortly, even all of that cannot warrant the favor that she is receiving, right? Mary, in many ways, biblically, is this kind of model person to be the the bearer of God. She represents a certain degree of humility and obedience, which is uh, almost unparalleled anywhere else other than in Jesus Himself in the Bible. And yet, even that much good life living before God cannot warrant this, right? You can't earn um, the, the honor of, of bearing God Himself. It is the result of His favor. God gives it. It is His prerogative to do so. But the second aspect of God's activity that you see tied to His promise, it, it flows out of God's power. Not only is His prerogative operative, but also His power. How will this all come about? Mary asks. Reasonable question. If ever there were a reasonable question, this is one, right? And Gabriel answers her, the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. This is the point. God does what He does according to His own power. He is not waiting for a little help from His friends, right? He's, he's ready to go. God not only has the authority to act, but He has the power to complete His actions. He is able to do what He determines to do, and He does so. And this is really good news for us. This may sound like a truism to you, but a lot of the faith in terms of how you live it and walk it out and allow it to feed your soul is actually by dwelling upon the things you already know by heart. And this is one that you have to think about to allow it to begin to produce freedom in your life. Here's how. I do not know about you, but I am essentially powerless when it comes to the important stuff in my life. Now, contrary to like whatever I believe about myself, week after week, certain things don't get done and I'm, I am powerless to accomplish them. I told my wife last night, I will unload that dishwasher. I woke up, guess who didn't? I was powerless. I did not get it done. And that's a hilarious example, but there's big ones too, and there's big ones too in your life, right? There are things that you've determined to do, things that you say, I will and must and should, and I, I'm going to, and then you look at it, and you didn't get it done for one reason or another. It's not always a knock on us. We are limited in our power, but God is not limited. I'm not able to do all that my heart desires to do, but God does not have this issue. He has all the power, and so I can transfer my trust to Him. Jesus will go on to say, all power is given to me in heaven and on earth. And I wrote a note next to this, note to myself, do I remember this 
as I pray? Do I remember this? Is, do I remember that there is one who has all the power? Do I allow that to inform my heart? So he's seen God's prerogative. He has favor on who he has favor. Can't earn it. God's gracious. He's got the power to accomplish what his favor has, has said should be done. And finally, God does the things he does according to God's purpose. God's purpose. What's the point of the Son of David, the Son of the Most High, coming into eternal authority? Well, the text says, so that he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. God's prerogative, God's power, these two things exist for God's purposes. He is going to accomplish His will in the earth, above the earth, under the earth. This is now 90% God, but God who does all the things He seeks to do, and He does them well. And His purposes, in the end, vindicate themselves. Lauren and I were out to dinner last night talking about God, which happens probably more than you'd expect, and we were uh, discussing this exact aspect. Like, how do you navigate life when you don't know why God's doing what He's doing? Well, you have to move from the character of God into the space in which you live and reason from His goodness into the ambiguity of the moment. We'll talk more about that in just a little bit, but the point is God's purposes are good, even though they're sometimes ambiguous and we can't see all of them at once. His purpose is good, so you can trust His power, you can trust His prerogative to work for His good purpose. You can trust Him with that authority. And here's how that's good news. As Christians, we follow a God who leads us with refreshing verve, with refreshing decision, with power. Because God is God and acts like it, we are free from having to play God. You ever thought about it that way? Somebody's got to be God. Is it you? (laughs) Is it me? No. We should think rightly about who gets to play God. There is only one fit for the part. His favor cannot be earned. Rather, it's His to bestow. That frees us from a life of dreadful earning. If you think about that, if God's grace is what's operative in the world, then all of my effort to work, you know, is is wrong-headed. I should receive. His promised work will be accomplished because of His own power rather than ours. This frees us from a life of constant worry about our limited capacities. I need this word, right? Finally, God will do His work for His reasons and for His divine purposes. This frees us from the burden of having to know all the answers. Rather than knowing it all, we are free to trust the one who does. This places human impossibility these, these sites of human impossibility, really, they are the sites of God's saving activity carried out according to His prerogative, His power, and His purpose. And, and to this we say hallelujah. To this we say amen. To this we close the book and we walk out into the world with a God that we can trust, that we can work with. So as we close, let's look at Mary as she does just that. Let's turn our attention to her. She demonstrates perfectly molded character here in this scene. She models perfectly what it looks like for us to stay open to the Almighty. Take a look. I think she does three things that that we've hinted at so far, but that she puts really clearly in her answer. When when she asked, how is all this going to be done? She gets her answer and she moves forward. And really, she's doing three things. The first is this. She models for us that we are to ask how God will fulfill His promises rather than if He will. This is huge faith from Mary. But this is where we can walk in faith and trust. She models this for us. She gives us the language for trusting God and moving forward. Ask how God will fulfill His promises rather than if He will. I know that this is, a, this is a, a site of faith for me each week, even last night as we were talking about God's purposes and His promises over dinner. 
Um, this was a bit of, of, of what we have to come to. We have to start with the supposition that God's good, and we're really asking and expecting Him to fulfill His promise in some way. And we're not, we're not doubling back in the language of if, but we're moving forward in the language of how. She does this well. There's another thing she does well. She receives the answers that God gives with reverent expectation rather than incredulous needling. Big words there, incredulous needling. I probably should have said something else, but you get the idea. She chooses reverent expectation when she hears the answer rather than ongoing um, pushing and prodding. And I think this is where we can experience hope. It's choosing this reverent expectation over incredulous needling that hope is now available to us. Gabriel has an authoritative word. Why not live into it as Mary does? And the third thing that I think she does for us here is that she shows how to press into the goodness of God in the midst of an enduring mystery. Right? I mean, think of the answer that she gets. Gabriel, oh, good question. God's just going to overshadow you. You know, you'll be pregnant and you'll move forward. Oh, that solves it. Like, what? Like, what kind of an answer is that? Like, it's an answer, right? It's true. It's, it's authoritative. But that doesn't tell you very much about what's going to actually happen to Mary. But you know, look at her answer, right? She just says, I'm the Lord's servant. Be unto me uh, as you would have. And she moves forward. She moves forward in a degree of rest, right? So we can experience faith and trust as modeled by Mary. We can experience hope as modeled by Mary. And we can have the rest that she has too because she stays open to the Almighty. The God that we serve is the God of the impossible. We do well to remember this and to stay open to whatever He might be doing next. As we looked at this annunciation scene of the coming of our Lord, we first considered what it means in a world of human impossibility. Then we examined the way that this scene elucidates the nature of these divine promises according to God's prerogative, His power, and His purpose. And finally, we considered together what it would look like to follow after Mary in this third week of Advent, to stay open to the Almighty. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for the inbreaking of your word into our world, for the clarity with which you speak to us, Lord, and that it's an invitation to have further faith, to step forward in, in hope, to rest in your goodness. Your word comes to us, and it is always an opportunity to do those things. We thank you that in your son Jesus, all of the questions of our heart find their yes and their amen. That in him, the sufficiency the world needs is found. In him, the bread of life fills the hungry heart. We thank you for him. We praise you in his name. And we pray in his name. Amen.